you so much for, for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Bartlett, and I'm the Dean of the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism, which is part of the CUNY uh, University system. And um, I'm really excited about tonight's event. I, I have been um, delighted to have Yoruba Richen overseeing our documentary program at the Journalism School for many years now. And she has uh, reared a, an amazing group of students under her tutelage and uh, somehow also managed to produce an extraordinary amount of, of really top-notch work. I've been, um, I think watching every film she's produced, I'm a huge fan, starting with The New Black, which if you haven't seen it, you have to see it. And uh, more recently, obviously The Green Book, which was a huge success, uh, The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which I gather she's just been nominated for an award for. And the reason you're here tonight, how it feels to be free, which uh, you're gonna hear a, a lot more about. I'm also really excited that uh, April Rain is able to join us this evening and to have this conversation with Yoruba. April, um, I think is best known for having created the hashtag Oscar so white, but that's really more illustrative of the long and steady work that she's applied to trying to bring more focus to race and representation in the, in the entertainment and film industry among other things, and a, a lawyer for 20 years to boot. So, I want to uh, get out of the way and let the evening uh, take take off. And so April and Yoruba, turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to the CUNY Newmark School of Journalism for allowing us to have this conversation today. Um, Yoruba, I, I wanna get right into the, the 50,000 questions that I have for you. Uh, so let's start at the very beginning. The, tell me, why you got into filmmaking as opposed to any other profession. Yes, um, so I also just wanna thank uh, my institutional home, Newmark and April for uh, our conversation. Uh, I know I've been looking forward to it. We, we've tweeted conversations, but now we get to talk in, in as person as we get. So I'm very excited. Um, so my path to filmmaking um, let's see. <laughs> I started out, I always promise I, I didn't go to film school. Um, I started out actually as like a theater person. I was a, the, I went to, I grew up here in New York. I went to uh, performing arts high school, LaGuardia High School. Um, I did theater. I grew up with a, a mom who was a playwright. And um, so storytelling was always something that I was innately drawn to. Um, and was modeled by my mom. And also not just storytelling, but looking at politics, um, the, the personal is always political uh, in my household. So uh, part of telling our story was about, um, you know, amplifying voices, black voices um, that, uh, you know, that that didn't have the, the, um, the platform. So that's really how I understood storytelling or the purpose of storytelling, or at least my, where my passion for it came. Um, I uh, didn't get, I'd always loved documentaries. Um, I remember seeing my first documentary on PBS. Um, I remember uh, watching Eyes on the Prize in high school um, and uh, Stanley Nelson's film, Madam C.J. Walker, about Madam C.J. Walker. Um, I. Uh, and that really changed my, you know, wow, this is an, an amazing, an amazing, um, fee, amazing, you know, amazing platform. It, it, who knew? Who knew about this? But it never seemed like something that I could actually do. Um, it didn't seem like a profession. This was in the. I didn't see many people like me in in it. Um, and uh, so it wasn't until like the the mid '90s when the camera started getting smaller and more accessible. And I made my first videos for classes. Um, my videos, you know, uh, it was, I, I, had, I was in graduate school um, in a, on a different, in a different topic, in a different field. I was doing, an, I did an urban planning degree, um, but I wanted to find, and I was, I was in uh, concentrating community development. So social issue, community development, um, and I wanted to find a way to tell these stories in a different way than just writing about them. And the stories of, you know, communities who 
um, again, who were out, not did not have the platform and their stories weren't being told. And so I made two videos, one about welfare reform uh, that was happening at the time, which was a big deal and how it affect this neighborhood in San Francisco. And then public education, uh, look at working with a group of students who were investigating their public education, their, their, public, their um, issues around public education. And quite frankly, I was hooked at that point. Um, it was like literally like an aha moment where I was, I, where I felt that uh, it really, this field um, what allowed me to be creative, allowed me to find out things, which I'm always, <laughs> you know, find out information, interview people, do research. So it really, um, ex it really, you know, allowed me to do to exercise these different parts of myself. Um, and I kind of never looked back. I uh, worked my way up. I moved back to New York. I worked my way up working with different documentary filmmakers. I went over to the news side for uh, a while. I worked in the investigative unit at ABC News, uh, which was good experience for me uh, as someone who hadn't gone to journalism school, <laughs> hadn't gone to film school. Um, so, but I always wanted to do what, you know, we called long form uh, at that point. I always wanted to do documentary film and, and I um, basically embarked on making my own film on a journalism fellowship. And uh, that turned into that five year journey turned into my first film and then then I just kept going somehow. And I was gonna ask you as a filmmaker, how you ended up in the J school, but I, I think you've told us, can you expound on that just a bit more? Yeah, um, let's see, I, uh, and I've been here for a while. Uh, so I had, I worked at ABC News and then I also worked at Democracy Now too. Um, and I, uh, um, and I was sort of, I've, always kind of straddled this line of journalism and documentary film. So um, I, the first, when I was first brought into to, to the Newmark School, I taught what we called at that time, broadcast news. Remember that? <laughs> that I remember work. Max Robinson. So, <laughs> you know, I am old Max. school, absolutely. Yes. And, that, and it, that's, not even, that's not even what it's called anymore, right? Um, so I taught broadcast news and, um, and then I taught in international reporting um, because I had done my, my first film was, uh, I had done two films that were international, um, you know, internationally based and, and was based internationally. Um, and really in terms of the documentary program, the students came to me and said, and by, at this point I was now starting my second documentary film, right? And they said to me, hey, we want to learn documentary. <laughs> why, like, why don't, you know, you should be teaching that. And we worked with the administration with the, the um, to, you know, to pitch a class on documentary filmmaking, which also too, at the same time, this was in about 2011, 2012. And this is really the sort of growth, the sort of beginning of the expansion that we really see of documentary film in terms of people and industry, in terms of people, you know, what people watch, uh, streaming, of course, has changed the game. And so that's how uh, we started off as a class. It started off as a, actually as a module, kind of like a six week module. And now it's, and then it turned into a class and now it's a, uh, a, 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 you know, a specialization. And I love that Newmark was open and flexible to receiving this pitch for the class because it, it just makes sense to me intuitively that journalists who are so great at investigative reporting can also and should also be filmmakers um, because, you know, they know how to get down into all of the, you know, the nitty gritty, the, the information that we all want to hear and, and watch. Absolutely. And, and documentary, I feel like, brings the best of both worlds from the journalism world, from the nitty grittiness, as you said, and also the creativity of filmmaking. So to me, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful field and it's very satisfying in that way, um, uh, just on, a, on an artistic level and uh, on, a, on a social issue level for me too. 
Absolutely. So I, I want to talk some about your work. I mean, you've done The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which was featured on FX and Hulu. You did The Sit-In, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, which premiered on MSNBC and is streaming on Peacock. Your film, The Green Book, Guide to Freedom, was broadcast on the Smithsonian Channel and was nominated for an Emmy. Uh, the New and Black the New Black and Promised Land won multiple festival awards. And now we're here talking about how it feels to be free, which premiered on PBS, but is now available to rent or own on Amazon Prime. So clearly you've got a focus. <laughs> so why, why do you think it is important to tell stories about Black people? So um, I think it, it's the reason why I got again, got, was interested in this field to, to begin with. I think growing up in the, growing up in the, the 80s, uh, this is when, you know, we had three channels um, and, you know, maybe cable, one cable network. Um, oh, you, y'all were wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I won't tell you how we got that. Remember how you used to hook up the cable box, but that's a whole I do, story. with all your friends outside. I'm exactly, like, yes. <laughs> so that, that's how that happened. Um, but, uh, and I grew up in Harlem, as I said, and, um, and something that, and I went to school for the first, my first uh, eight years, so eighth grade, I went to school, a private school on the Upper East Side. And one of the things that is, you know, that I, I still remember and think about is um, an experience, you know, remember the experience of um, hearing, again, what narratives were uh, dominant. And what narratives, what narratives um, had political power, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, New York was much more, well, New York is still segregated, but even more segregated at that time, I felt like. Uh, and go, being, growing up in these different neighborhoods and really experiencing, you know, what at that time was like the 96th Street divide um, of, of wealth and race. And um, so that just was something that was in, that injustice and that um, uh, the fact that our voices were not, um, our stories weren't, weren't being told or were being uh, told you know, incorrectly and not by us for the most part. So I think what part of what drives me in storytelling is correcting that and changing the lens, changing the narrative. Um, a lot of us filmmakers talk about that. Uh, and a lot of us filmmakers of color talk about that. Um, and it's really important. And, and our story is, first off, there's so many stories. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker. I, I'm interested in all kinds of things. Um, uh, and, you know, not, not just, you know, Black African-American stories. But I do think there's such a fascinating wealth of stories that you know, that just haven't been told. It's just a, it's like a kid in a candy store in some ways, you know, what, um, so I just, th there's just so much to dive into and to tell. Um, and that's why I think it's important. And it's also important because, you know, we made this country and we made this country what it is. Um, and we see the mis, what miseducation and when stories are uh, not told or excluded or misunderstood deliberately or, or not, what can happen? And what, you know, we, I think we see it today with what's going on in our country uh, in terms and what's gone on for the last, not just four years, but, um, you know, so yeah, <laughs> I, could, I could go on, but basically our stories are American stories and we need massive uh, understanding about our history and about our present day experience. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you and Stanley Nelson, who you mentioned of Firelight Media, have truly been holding it down for Black folks in the documentary space. Um, and it, it's just incredibly important because our public education system is failing us year after year after year. And we are not getting stories um, about our people, about our culture. You know, I think it's, you know, representation matters, right? We can say it over and over and over again. But I think the point that you bring home is that what also matters and what I think are the two most important questions in storytelling are um, who is telling the story and whose story is being told. 
right? And you have to marry those um, to have those really in-depth conversations about race, about culture, and, you know, and about all the intersections amongst them. Absolutely. Uh, I was just going to say the, you know, part of the reckoning, I mean, we seem to be in a reckoning every, you know, other year, uh, and we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for example, the Oscar So White campaign that you started, I mean, really began a conversation or elevated a conversation around representation and who's telling the story. And the documentary field uh, was something that, uh, that it was and is something that also needs to uh, reckon with who's telling the story and what story is being told and the lens of the storytelling. Um, so I think we're seeing a conversation, you know, in the field, in the industry that, you know, we, we certainly had, didn't see when I started in this industry. So let's talk specifically about how it feels to be free. I know this was adapted for, or the, you know, the idea came from a book. Um, so, so what was it about these six women, their stories that appealed to you that you wanted to make this into a documentary? So when I read the book, um, actually even before I read the book, when I read the review of the book, um, I thought it would make a powerful film. And it was a story, the stories of these women and how they change representation um, through their activism on and off screen um, and through uh, how they built on each other's career. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're, we're a cohort in some ways and um, set the stage for what we see in terms of um, storytelling and the, the sort of renaissance, one could argue, of black storytelling that we see today. These women laid the groundwork. Um, I will say that in the book, I did switch uh, the book. Uh, one of the women is Miriam Makeba the amazing South African singer. And I um, put, I uh, substituted, not substituted, but I um, added Pam Greer uh, in my film. And I did that because I wanted to uh, get us to a contemporary moment story-wise so we can you know, talk about today uh, and what we're seeing today. Um, but I, I thought it was such an interesting take it, that I hadn't seen and also that it wasn't a biography. So it's obviously the film is not a biography of these women birth to death, um, but really looks at their impact and their legacy, which I think can, in some ways, I mean, biographies have their, their place for sure, but looking at the impact and the legacy, I think makes us understand these women in a different way. Um, and frankly, I, uh, you know, one of my frustrations ha have been when white filmmakers, um, oftentimes when white filmmakers tell our story about, um, you know, about our icons, um, there's a focus on tragedy. And um, that really has, you know, frustrated me and angered me in the past. And um, not saying that tragedy isn't, you know, a part, and part of artists' lives, but I think it obscures, it can tend to obscure what these, uh, you know, what these entertainers, this in this case, these women meant, you know, in terms of the entertainment industry and in terms of, um, in terms of the black community and in terms of how we saw ourselves. That, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, these, all of them were full women, <laughs> you know, not just, they weren't just the tragedy that they endured and they, they all had pain and suffering at, at one point, um, but it, it sort of minimizes who they were um, to only focus on the negative or the down, you know, the, the valley before you get to the mountain. Um, you mentioned yeah. activism and I, I'd love to touch on that a little bit more because all of them in their own way were activists. I think the new word we're using is artivists, the combination of artists and activists. I, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the role of art as activism, both for these women and today. Yeah, I thought obviously a lot, I've been thinking a lot about that uh, in making this film. Um, one of the things I think is that for, especially for African-Americans, um, art and activism have, have always been 
intertwined. Um, I think that the very fact of us, uh, you know, going out and showing some representation of us is uh, is a political act, um, especially pushing against, you know, representation um, that, you know, stereotypes and, and, and tropes that have been very harmful. So um, there's, there's that. And I think that uh, someone, and we mentioned him in the film, but uh, <clears throat> Paul Robeson is someone who really is kind of the prototype. I mean, Harry Belafonte, uh, you know, is inspired uh, by the, who Paul Robeson was as, as this deep thinker, deep artist, incredible artist, deep activist, and Lena Horne as well. He was, you know, we talked about that in the film. So um, I think that the activism is uh, sort of Im embedded for a lot of our black entertainers as part of their, you know, what they want to do, their responsibility, um, and how art can change, you know, how we think and how we see. Um, and that is, you know, incredibly important to changing, you know, society. Right, and, and they have the platform, right? And, and so there should be, in my mind, a responsibility to have these conversations. I mean, the issue is sometimes our celebrities and public figures <laughs> are not on the right side of things. And it's like, please shut up. That's right. right. You know, look at you, up. Ice Cube. You know? yes. but we can name some others. But you know, someone, I was on a panel and someone put this very well. It's not just about speaking out. It's looking at what you're doing, right? And your commitment to the issue and the cause, whatever it is. Um, so we have a lot of people who talk <laughs> and, uh, or who tweet, uh, but you know, it's, it goes much deeper than that. And I think with these women, uh, and with figures like Harry Belafonte, who, you know, I did a, a film earlier this year or last year about, you know, and Paul Robeson, you see that deep commitment. I mean, that's, you know, that's a deep commitment. And, and you see it with s some of the, you know, some of the entertainers that we have today. I think that's right. And and the fact that they were able to do it decades ago, you know, during Jim Crow, before Jim Crow, you know, when things were segregated and, um, you know, they were significantly worse, you know, we're definitely not out of the woods, but, you know, this could actually have cost their lives. Um, whereas when, you know, artivists speak out now, uh, you know, we can talk about cancel culture, which I don't really think is a thing, you know, but, but, but that's the only significant pushback that there is, you know, there, right. there isn't a concern about literally life and limb. Yeah, totally. You know, one thing I think is interesting is uh, with the Oscar So White campaign that the, um, the fact that the, um, and I came across this in the film, we didn't necessarily get to include it, but um, that the black people have been protesting the Oscars for, for a long time. Um, and they laughed at them. I remember, I even remember in like the 90s and late 80s when Jesse Jackson led protests at the Oscars and he was like ridiculed, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is a longstanding issue around representation in Hollywood that was built on, I mean, literally brick by brick built on, on racism and sexism. That's exactly right. And and white supremacy. I mean, I definitely, you know, I was in the right place at the right time with the right social media platform. You know, I could not have stood on a corner in LA or anywhere else and said, Oscar's so white and, you know, and had a long standing conversation about issues of equity and inclusion. But I stand on the shoulders of, you know, Harry Belafonte that you've mentioned, Paul Robeson, you know, all the way back to Hattie McDaniel. They have been fighting for decades and decades. You're absolutely right. Uh, so you mentioned um, something that didn't make it into the film. I would love to know, it, was there something significant that was left on the editing room floor and, and how you make those choices, right? You're talking about six phenomenal women. You know, you don't want to have a six hour long <laughs> film. So how do you make those choices and, and what did you have to leave behind if, if there was anything significant? Yeah, I mean, because it wasn't a biopic, and I knew that from the, the start, we did have to leave out some biographical information that, you know, um, 
that we, you know, and we did try, sometimes we try, try to, try to include it. Um, but we, you know, in terms of cutting and, and, and um, refining, we had, to, we had to leave out. So for example, um, Nina, um, uh, Lena Horn, uh, not only was she a singer and, and an actress, but she was also uh, one of the, if not the first black pinup girl. Um, and that was very important for the soldiers in World War II to have their own beauty icon that they can literally, you know, look to and um, and you know admire and um, and have their own have their own pinup girl, which was you know big in the forties. <laughs> so that was one one piece uh, that we that we couldn't we couldn't put in. And then you said significant. I know it's not significant, but I think the scenes of, it's significant in the same way, the scenes of Diane Carroll and Dynasty, like, I love. <laughs> Those are significant. What are you talking about? I mean, that, you know, we keep, you, yes. the running theme here is representation matters. And I yes. remember Dynasty for sure. Oh and God. I mean, she turned the world on its head. It was a huge like this, skill. Yeah. I mean, this black woman with the fur stole yeah. and, you know, telling her the champagne was flat. That Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was amazing. Amazing. And again, a huge deal because, especially because we had so few uh, shows of where black people were in the 1980s. Like we're not talking about, like, you know. Especially wealthy. People. Yeah, and of wealthy course, black wealthy, people. yeah, totally. And you know, and, she's, and she says, she's like, I wanted to not like my children. I wanted to be, a, you know, just concerned about money and, and to be able to have that creative, you know, freedom, some creative freedom. Um, so basically I would have liked to put more dynasty footage in there. <laughs> And for various reasons, I, you know, I could not. We're going to have to figure out how to find some of those old Dynasty episodes oh, and, and have some kind of watch party or something. Exactly. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I want to remind all of the folks who are watching today that we are going to be taking questions for our Q&A session near the end. So you can put your questions in the chat um, and they can be seen. Once again, I also want to remind you that How It Feels to be Free is available on Amazon Prime for both um, rental and to own if you'd like. Uh, so let me hit the next question. Um, I'm always interested about the process, especially with documentary filmmakers. You know, what I know um, listening to Stanley Nelson at Sundance and, and others is that money is always the biggest problem, you know, and, and I imagine that's especially true with documentaries because they're not flashy and you're not blowing things up. Um, so what challenges did you face when making this film? So yeah, it was, it was about money. <laughs> this was a project that took five years to make. Um, I actually, when I read it, I actually thought it was, it was pretty fundable. I mean, you're dealing with women that are well-known, um, you know, uh, which, which can be helpful, right? Um, I got initial support uh, from the PBS world, which has supported my, all of my films um, that I've done independently. Uh, Black Public Media um, came in very early. They're an incredible, uh, institution that supports black filmmakers and 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 black uh, films with black themes uh, for PBS broadcasts. Um, uh, Independent Lens came in very early, another PBS strand for development funding, um, and uh, and American Masters as well for development funding, and develop that allowed us to go out, uh, do some initial interviews. Uh, get some initial archive, and then really put together a kind of pitch trailer um, to, you know, to find the rest of the money. And um, that took four years. I, um, and, the, you know, and it could be various reasons why that's the case. Um, but uh, it was disheartening for a while. There were some close, you know, some, some, some close, encounters where we thought we were going to get it. Um, we put a lot of, me and my producers, uh, put a lot of effort and time um, into trying to find funding. And that, a lot, a lot of times that means writing grants that you don't get. Um, so it became disheartening. And it wasn't until um, 
we in, we met, my producers met uh, a Canadian company, Yap Films. Um, and I see some folks from there are, are, are on, on this talk um, that they started talking about this project to them. Uh, and, uh, they started talking about this project to them and they immediately were uh, interested and wanted to uh, do it and said, we can help you get this done. And so we worked with Yat Films, a Canadian co-production company who were able to bring in Canadian tax credits, which is something that happens in other countries uh, where government actually supports the arts and <laughs> supports documentary. Imagine uh, that. Imagine that. And, um, and that and they were able to bring together the rest of the funding. Um, and uh, it became, you know, uh, so they became producers of the project. Uh, we worked with, uh, at that point, Canadian crew, um, and uh, we were, of course, planning, you know, the, before COVID, uh, the plan was that I would go up, you know, and actually work with the editor and uh, all that. Uh, obviously, that changed, and we had to work remotely, but I did go at the end, uh, because it, uh, basically, we ended up having a pretty tight production schedule um, and had to deliver the film for, for January of this year. And so um, I ended up going up to Toronto, um, quarantining for two weeks as per law in Canada. Um, and then- Oh, look at that. The yes. administration actually. <laughs> yes. Isn't that amazing? God bless Canada. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, working with the uh, the editors uh, uh, in person, um, and that was really you know that was really important. Um, and so yeah, so now the the film is streaming. So it's also available in Canada uh, as well on uh, Gem, their streaming network. I, I love that, and I, I want to say, Patricia in the chat says we need to demand that public TV get more funding for independent filmmakers. Yoruba, you should not have to spend years of your creative life doing this fundraising. Amen to that. I, <laughs> I, I, yes, and thank you for that, Patricia. And I do have to say, it was a bit frustrating um, going to funders who you know who knew my work, who knew um, who knew. You know, knew the knew obviously the 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 story and said, you know, I mean, literally we got to um, we got to finalists at a bunch of places and didn't get it. And you know, is it because it's black women? You know, and it's still, you know, they it's still can they still they still don't see the importance of our stories? Um, oh, another early funder too was Chicken and Egg. I have to say, um, which is a, a supporter and funder of of women filmmakers and um, have been incredible. So um, they, you know, some people saw it, but a lot of people didn't. <laughs> well, you also had some star power involved. Can you tell me, you know, what was Alicia Key's role as executive producer here? Yeah, so, um, and Chicken and Egg is actually uh, the person who facilitated the meeting between um, uh, me and Alicia's, um, Alicia's producer at the time, uh, her TV and, and film producer. So uh, we met, I met her and funnily enough, she had also read the book and said, this should be a film and was trying to figure out how to make it a film. And um, so it was, you know, immediately again, it was, okay, like let's join forces and, and make this happen. Um, and, uh, they were great. I mean, at that point, we were really trying to get, you know, we did the interview with Alicia um, and we really uh, uh, tried to get the funding. And, you know, obviously we, having her, her as executive producer um, was, was important. She ended up looking at uh, uh, cuts and giving feedback. Um, and, um, and as I said, an, an inter interview as well. Absolutely. And you had some great interviews in there. I mean, not just Alicia Keys, but Halle Berry, who to this date is the only Black woman to have won the Best Actress Oscar in the, I think, 94, 95 year history of the Academy Awards. So exactly. It, yeah. I mean, we knew we were going to try to get her, obviously. I mean, she really brings the, um, she really brings the, uh, you know, really brings it forward. And also the frustration that she had um, uh, that she still has in terms of getting 
stories and uh, black stories told. Um, right. And she was, you know, very enthusiastic. Her people were, were great. Um, Lena Waithe, we also knew we needed creators because that's really where the power lies, right? Be, being behind the camera, making the decisions, writing the stories. And Lena, I think is such an amazing, uh, you know, what she's got going on is brilliant and amazing and political. Um, so I was so happy to, to have her as part of it. Yolanda Ross, who's also on this, uh, I see um, in this, in the audience, um, who was fantastic to, to uh, interview and to be a part of, um, uh, you know, her, uh, her work has been, I've been following her work since Stranger Inside when I first saw her um, in the, I guess that was the early 2000s. So yeah, I mean, we had, we had great participants, uh, Sam and Latanya, um, I love how you say that. The Samuel L. Jackson is now just <laughs> Sam and Latanya. Okay, I, I listen. All praise. I'm, I'm here. For, I'm here for the familiarity. And of course, we were able to interview Diane uh, before she passed. I think we had one of the last interviews with with Diane Carroll, um, and so that was really, really important. I didn't get to interview Cicely, um, but I did get to meet her, uh, and so I'm so so, um, you know, happy to have that encounter. She was wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. I, so I'm, I'm interested, you know, it's definitely the case with respect to feature films, but even with documentaries, I'm, I'm wondering, what did you learn when making this film? I mean, you know, I learned a lot. I, I definitely didn't know enough about Abby Lincoln. And so that was probably my favorite part just because I was learning as opposed to remembering things that I already knew. What, what did you learn when making this film? Certainly Abby's story was, I learned a lot uh, from about Abby's story. I, I knew her, I'd only known her actually as, um, before I started making the film, as a jazz singer in later, later life. Um, but her story I think is incredible. And I think it, it, what's interesting is that it predates, um, it predates Nina in some ways. I mean, we, uh, she had one of the, you know, first albums that was explicitly political and popular, popular, uh, and political. Um, and she also went through a transfer for transformation in terms of wearing her hair natural, in terms of um, you know throwing off the the um, you know the 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 Maryland dress the the red dress um, and embracing her blackness and you see how she was I mean the incredible footage from the CBC which our amazing archivists found of how she was you know vilified vilified I mean that footage I mean we had I knew that she was crit criticized by um, the downbeat uh, critic that was in the book. So that was always gonna be part of the story. But when we found that, when she found that footage of her being, having to defend her work and being, basically defend being black, it's to me is just unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, so Abby's story I think is really, I learned so much. Um, also the, uh, on the, on the sort of later end uh, or a bit later end, the, um, I thought it was really interesting the black exploitation and the uh, pushback that it got from you know people at the time and from Cicely Tyson, quite you know frankly, who really critiqued these images um, as stereotypes. Uh, I thought was you know understanding the depth of of uh, you know of that debate within within the black community. Let's dive into that a little bit more. I think the phrase that we use now is respectability politics, and I'm definitely not a fan. Um, but you you mentioned the 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 pushback, and you know that has always been an issue. You know, and part of that is because black people are not a monolith, so you know not everybody is going to like everything. But there are issues about colorism um, that could come up. You know, there are issues about uh, whether someone should show 
you know, someone, you know, living their real life when they may be living in poverty or if we should all be pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. So talk a little bit more about the pushback that the women that were, that were in your film um, received just attempting to be their full black selves and the roles that they chose. Yeah, and this is also what I learned. Uh, uh, Lena Horn, that I, her contract, right? which was an incredibly groundbreaking contract and that she got them to put in her contract that she's not gonna pay, play maids or people in the jungle as her, uh, her daughter says. Um, but she got pushback from the black people in Hollywood who were out there who were playing those roles because they said, you know what, if she doesn't, if she refuses to play those roles, well, are they gonna still have roles? Are they still gonna make those roles? You know. Um, there's, uh, oh, this is another part that I would have loved to explore a little bit more, but there's sort of, um, there's, uh, uh, what's to say, it's, it's a little bit of, of lore that Hattie McDaniel and uh, Lena Horne um, had a, uh, you know, had issues, that Hattie McDaniel had issues with, with Lena Horne um, because she was the new young light skin uh, girl on the block who wasn't playing mates. Um, Lena says in, in interviews though, that Hattie was very gracious to her, but initially, uh, there seems to have been some, um, you know, some tension there and, uh, which just epitomizes, you know, what that tension was, uh, that she was getting from, from the black community and then black exploitation, as we said, and Julia even, um, Julia, which was this incredible, with Diane Carroll, this incredibly successful show, right? It was actually very popular. And um, groundbreaking. I mean, it's the first time. Absolutely. Yeah. Groundbreaking. It's the first time we had a Black woman in the lead that, you know, didn't play, uh, you know, a, a service worker in that, in that sense. Exactly. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, as Diane said, we thought, you know, we should be able to have this role, you know, even if she wasn't out there protesting. Miss Julia came out in 1968. So times were a changing. Um, in terms of, you know, politics and in terms of what we were demanding. Um, and uh, she uh, got pushback. We have that scene, we found that uh, footage with Red Fox, you know, um, saying what Julia should be, you know, basically saying it's unrealistic and she'd be selling drugs out of the hospital it looking, you know, fine like that with those nice clothes. And then Diane takes it, she, you know, she takes it with such stride. I love it. Um, but she says, you know, we think we thought we should be able to have that role. Um, she, she got, she got pushed back from the audience. We read, you know, the audience, the letters, um, in the, you know, some of the letters that were sent to her. Yeah, th this is a complete aside, but I am a Sesame Street fanatic. Uh, and I remember Roosevelt Franklin, who was purple, but he was clearly <laughs> a black Muppet that was raised by a single mom in the projects. And in fact, um, that Muppet got pushed back to the point that where they pulled it. And the pushback was coming from the black community who mm -hmm. said, oh, well, we don't want to show, you know, and it's like, he's purple, <laughs> you, know? Right. you know, and, right. and in the same way, I mean, yes, I mean, you know, she, she wasn't a neurosurgeon, but she was a nurse. And why can't black women be nurses, right? You know, because they, she, she should be upwardly mobile or whatever phrase we want to use. And, and so it, it's a, it's a really a weird argument to make and a weird hill to die on. Totally. And I think we still see it. I mean, luckily today, I do think we have more diversity in, you know, we can have uh, morally ambiguous characters. We can be villains. Uh, as as uh, Lena says, you know, we can be heroes and villains, which is, which is great. But, you know, because representation still is an embattled, uh, you know, an, an emb embattled, these, these arguments still come up too. That's right. And so let's just segue a little bit into some of the struggles that you see um, Black women still facing in, in entertainment, both in front of and especially behind the camera where you are. Yeah, I think that um, there's still, uh, I mean, f first off, in both fiction and in, in documentary, you know, white men are still, and white people are still the gatekeepers, right? So that is an issue in terms of what stories end up being greenlit, funded, told. 
Um, so that's still a challenge. Um, and until that changes, you know, we're gonna have to see, um, you know, we're gonna have to see what happens. Uh, every industry has, as the ra this ra last racial reckoning, all industries are uh, looking inward and trying to, you know, make changes or at least profess to make changes. And we'll see what actually happens. Lena Way actually said, and we didn't get to include this. She said though, that there should be penalties for not having a writer's room that's diverse um, or, you know, having, um, you know, diversity in, in the, in the production and in the crew, that that's how you do it. You actually have to like, you know, have penalties. Um, there's, uh, and of course there's like pushback, you know, about that and, and people freak out. I mean, people freaked out when they, um, you know, with, and I think this was also because of Oscar So White or largely when they were integrating, <laughs> integrating the Academy, <laughs> where they're bringing in all new members, the pushback, that you know to make it uh, more reflective of our society. There were I remember reading articles in Deadline where like you know so older you know they they would they never would name them, but it was like you know these older white actors were like oh my god like what's happening what's going on. So there's still resistance, right? There's still resistance to having stories and to an in, to having stories that are inclusive, diverse. And um, and having the people tell those stories be from those communities, it's not just the African American community; it's marginalized communities. That's right. Uh, you know, and Oscar So White was not just about Black folks; it was about all traditionally underrepresented communities, regardless of race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and so on. And so, you know, because we contain multitudes and we should be more intersectional when we have these conversations about inclusion. You know, it's not just about checking the box, it's about providing opportunities to folks. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, at that time in 2016, the Academy president was Cheryl Boone Isaacs, a black woman. And after the second year of no people of color nominated for any of the acting categories, she um, committed to doubling the number of people of color and doubling the number of women within the membership ranks by last year, by 2020. And in fact, that happened. Now, the Academy is still <laughs> overwhelmingly <laughs> white and overwhelmingly male, but it's slightly better than it was before. But this is how... Julie Dash became an Academy member. This is how Melvin Van Peebles became an Academy, an Academy member. People that we hold on our, you know, we hold up high, you know, as, as prototypes to, uh, you know, genius in filmmaking. But because of, again, the gatekeepers, they were not going to get into the Academy uh, in any other way because of the rules that, that are required. And um, I, just I, want, I just wanted to add one quick thing that in the documentary branch, it was the same thing. And Roger Ross Williams. Uh, yes, who has Oscars, yes. Yes, who won the first black director to win an Oscar and has been doing so much to bring folks into the, the documentary branch of, of the Academy. Not that the Academy is the only, you know, I, I don't want to use that as the only way, you know, to be, uh, you know, the only thing that we should be concerned about or that's how you, that's where success is measured. But it does seem to be where we have some hard numbers to, to look at and can, um, you know, so use that as, you know, as an example. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, there was a story out in the LA Times just the other day about the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, which runs the Golden Globes. They have less than 100 members. None of them are Black. Nobody knows who they are. No, <laughs> you know, but these are the ones, <laughs> you know, that are, you know, making the nominations and, and voting on, on these films, you know, voting on our films. And then you wonder why, you know, Michaela's, you know, I Will Destroy You doesn't yes, get any nominations. Get well, there's a reason yeah. for that. Absolutely. Yeah. And but you know, going back to the academy just for a second, it is not the end all be all. You know, and this is something that I've attempted to hammer home as well because especially for black women when excuse my dog in the background everyone. <laughs> uh, especially for black women, um, even when they win, for example, best supporting actress, you know, we can talk about Monique, we can talk about Octavia Spencer, uh, you know, we can talk about Viola Davis. They are not getting the work that one would assume. They can't add a zero to the end of their next check. They are still on 
auditioning for roles that are beneath them, truly. Um, and so having the phrase Oscar nominee or Oscar winner after your name does not pretend, uh, portend the opportunities that one would assume would happen. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. I see one question here that I actually wanted to address about should black filmmakers only be relegated to telling black stories? And I see Yolanda said, no, we should be able to do anything as long as it's well done. And that's true. Um, we shouldn't be, nobody should be relegated to, to do, uh, you know, as, as artists, we're artists. But I will say that white filmmakers so, for so long, and I'm speaking specifically about documentary, have told our stories that, um, and are still, still doing it, that I think there, you know, that there needs to be, if that, ha if that happens and if a white filmmaker is given, um, you know, a, an opportunity or, or uh, you know, either commissioned or is telling the stories, they have to, they need to work really, really hard to make sure that they are working with people of color, that they are working, that they are training people of color, that they are, um, and that their lens, again, the lens is correct, <laughs> you, you know? And so there's lots of work that has to be done, I think, in order for white filmmakers um, to, uh, you know, if they're gonna tell black stories. Um, that, that's right. Yeah, you know, I get that question all the time. Oh, are you saying that only black folks can? Make? No, what I'm saying is that there needs to be cultural competency. So if you don't have it, yeah. <laughs> hire someone yeah. that, you know, that does as exactly. an executive producer or showrunner or whatever the case may be, because we've seen way too many examples. I mean, you did a film on, on the Green Book, right? A documentary, the actual film, the Green Book didn't do what it should have. And that's mm -hmm. because again, as we were talking about, who is telling the story? And in fact, especially with Green Book, whose story is being told? We found out more about the chauffeur than yeah. you know, Dr. Shelley. And so as someone pointed out uh, in uh, one of my Q and A's around that film, black hands never touched the, 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 the Green Book in that film. It was only the white chauffeur. I mean, that made absolutely no sense, right? Even though the Green Book was only in it for like 10 seconds, but the fact that it was, um, you know, what a missed opportunity in to tell that story in fiction, you know, in a fiction context. But yeah, I mean, that's a great example. That's right. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left. So I want to open it up if there are any additional questions. I know we've been responding to the chat as much as possible. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any questions that you um, could flag for us potentially. Yep, April, I just sent you a few right there in your chat. Thank Anyone you. Else, please feel free to ask any questions that we have about five, 10 minutes left. So the first one I see, thank you, Jennifer, is does Yoruba think things are finally changing? I think that things are, I mean, I have to say that things are changing. When I, when I look at, you know, how I grew up, the documentary, um, you know, documentaries, uh, who was making documentaries, um, the industry, versus today, I mean, there are the, the cohort of, of black, of people of color filmmakers in the documentary space is amazing. We have amazing organizations like Brown Girl Doc Media, um, Doc Mafia. Um, we have, you know, and many more that are really bringing together, you know, Firelight, Stanley Nelson's uh, program, mentorship program, Chicken and Egg that are really nurturing filmmakers, um, women and people of color. And that is, I've really seen that growth because um, that was not there when I first started. Um, so that's amazing, um, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, it's always that case, like we make progress, right? But then we still have a long way to go. I think in the fiction world, we, the fact that we see these um, amazing writers, creators, you know, as I said, Lena Waithe, others, a Ava, DeVarnay, you know, Shonda, I mean, all these things, powerful women telling multiple different, on multiple platforms, right? Got the Netflix deal, got the HBO deal. That's incredible. Um, and so that's, that's just incredible. Rada Blanc, as someone just said, um, it's, it's, it's amazing. But the, if you still look at the numbers, right? Because it's so, uh, the, there were so few of us before, we still have a long way to go in terms of gaining that, those numbers, in terms of changing those numbers. So it's, and, and 
we will see that with this reckoning, what happens? I think the jury is still out. Absolutely. Now, several times um, people have asked this question. It was going to be my last, so I want to make sure that we get it in uh, just in time. How do you choose which stories to tell? And relatedly, what is next for you? What is the next story you will tell? Um, so how do you choose? Really, for me, it's kind of, it's almost instinctual. It's like when I read the How It Feels to Be Free, I was like, oh my gosh, I see it. You know, um, it's, it's instinctual. I get inspiration from all different places, from books, from articles, from talking to people, um, from watching films. Uh, I think as a documentary filmmaker, you have to be very open. That's also what I love and open to uh, experiences and to, you know, to where you're gonna get your inspiration. Um, and then what was the last question? Oh, what's next for me? So what's next for me, which is on the plate is a film I'm co-directing with uh, my co-director who I think is part of the audience, Brad Lichtenstein. We are uh, doing a film about an unsolved civil rights murder uh, from, uh, for Frontline. And it's looking, it's part of an initiative looking at all the unsolved civil rights cases that were supposed to be reopened under the Emmett Till Act uh, passed in 2007 and, and then uh, passed again in 2016 and how nothing was solved. None of these cases were solved. And these families, and this was racial terrorist you know, cases um, and these families were, were failed by this country. Um, and so we're looking at one particular case in Natchez, Mississippi, where the uh, NAACP uh, uh, head there was bombed and his son found him. Um, and there's a local white, there's a local Klan offshoot group that committed a lot of murders that never were solved in this area in Natchez. Wow, that, that's, I, I'm waiting, I, give, give me, give me now, give, put it into my veins, right? I'll take that. <laughs> uh, there's a really interesting question that says, there's a lot of talk about reparations today. What would reparations look like in the world of documentaries? Oh, whoa, I don't know if I've ever been asked that. That's really interesting. You know, I uh, wish I could come up with something that'd be like, yes, this would be the answer. Um, one of the things that I have fantasized about doing is being able to have my own, my own um, pile of money, pile of money, <laughs> where I could fund films about the African diasporic experience and I could give funding that's really significant. So that's the thing about, about uh, documentary film. A lot of times you're getting little pieces here and little pieces here, but to be able to have uh, you know, money to be able to support other filmmakers of color. I think that's one way. I mean, a lot of it is financial, like reparations is financial, right? We need, we need the money. Um, so that's one thing I could think of, but that's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I love that question. <laughs> I, I have never seen that question before. Yeah. Uh, last question, because we're yeah. almost out of time. Um, someone has asked, how have you grown and what lessons can you share? How have I grown? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that how I've grown at this age of mine is that um, I, well, one of the things that I realized that I wanted to do after not doing, you know, a number of, you know, after my first couple of films is that I hope to expand artistically um, and to try different things. Um, I think that we, we see, we're seeing a lot of innovation in documentary film, which is amazing. And so I'm trying to, you know, push myself artistically. Um, how I've grown is um, I don't feel as much of an, the imposter syndrome as I felt to, to begin with. Um, it was a real issue <laughs> uh, to begin with um, for a lot of different reasons. Partly again is not the you know not seeing enough of us in the field, and lessons to impart. I would say, um, you know, it's a risky it's a risky field, but it's so worth it. So don't it's not not being afraid to take risks, um, and that's risk creatively and also risks in terms of following your passion and your drive to tell to tell your story, but also always know how to support yourself too. 
I love that. And it, that is a wonderful way to end. Yoruba, thank you so much uh, for speaking with me this evening. I want to, again, thank CUNY and the, the Newmark School um, for providing this opportunity. Um, I want to remind folks that How It Feels to Be Free is available on Amazon Prime for rent or purchase. Uh, and I think I'll turn it back over to Sarah to close us out. Thank you once again. Thank you. This was great. Um, and for those who didn't see the answer, we will be sending the link uh, to so that you can share this with your friends. Um, April and Yoruba, thank you so much. Fascinating conversation. And um, I hope to help you get that big pot of money. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, yeah. everyone, for, for tuning in. Take care. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Thank you.